Welcome to tonight's episode, this week's episode of This Week in Science's live podcast broadcast. Yo, Blair. Yo, Justin. You ready to do a show? Hey, yo. Yeah, what? What? Awesome. Sorry, was that, did that, what did are that those? Too hot? <laughs> I don't even I know, know what, what era those reactions are from. I don't, I don't even know. I mean, it could be the 90s, like the 1690s, the, even. The noggin is all I got. <laughs> We're here to talk about science. If you enjoy this program, make sure you click on the subscribe button below the notifications bell if you want to be reminded about our recording and our going live whenever we do a live broadcast. Um, and yeah, let's do this thing that we do on a weekly basis that sometimes might be edited for the 90 minutes for the podcast or for radio, but it's just live. That's it. If we mess up, Ooh. it's just mess up. <laughs> if we have hiccups, we just ah, have the hiccups. Dropping things. Okay, sorry. So when all of this talk about having Did I tight cue 90s, you? I do you that on purpose? I think you jinxed me. Hiccups. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. What are you guys I'm ready? doing? This I suppress the professional. You're making it 90. take longer now. Let's go. This is a professional show. Justin, you're holding Act us like up. It. Let's you're go. Holding us up now. <laughs> oh, it's me. Beginning in a three, two. This is twist This week in science, episode number eight hundred seventy-nine, recorded on Wednesday, June eighth, two thousand twenty-two. Oceans of science. On Ocean Science, on Ocean Science Day? No, let me say that headline again. Oceans of Science on Ocean Day. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with lava life, zinc requirements, and ugly fish. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer! The world is going to hell in a handbasket, but there are things we can do to prevent it. We need the willpower. That's it, just the willpower to do it. We can halt the rise of carbons in the atmosphere that threaten our cities, our food sources, and the intricate web of every living creature on the planet, if we have the willpower to make some changes. We can reduce gun deaths, homelessness, poverty, and hatred, if we have the willpower to make some changes. We can overcome illness, manage pathologies, cure diseases, if we have the willpower to make some changes. The changes aren't impossible, they actually aren't even hard, the changes we need to reach a sustainable, healthy, secure future, they're already available to us. We just lack the willpower to act, to do, to engage. And actually, that's not even true. Willpower has nothing to do with it. We lack the knowledge of how to act, how to do, and how to engage. And actually, again, that, that's also not entirely true because we have the knowledge of how to act, how to do, and how to engage. We have the results of policies around the nation and from around the world over all of history. We know the outcomes of actions. We know the outcomes of change. And we know the outcome of our status quo as well. If you're not concerned with the threat of the status quo, if you aren't activated to do some form of activism, if you are not interested, if you do not care, you have not been listening to This Week in Science. Coming up next... And, Blair. and a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science on World Oceans Day. Woo. The sounds. Instead of wooing, um, you know, yes. Giving us the sounds of the ocean. Yes. Like just put your uh, ear you're, up to a nice conch. You're you still the just focused on the foamy waves on the edges. The ocean is so much bigger than you imagine. So Some, much. some places it smell. It sounds like. 
really, yeah. really. It's underwater. Oh, okay. It sounds like that, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, the that's, majority of it sounds. This like This is that. all very exciting. What if it also? <laughs> what if it also sounded a little bit like this? Would that be impressive? No, hold on. Here it comes. Oh, okay. Is that there, a wave harp? At- you're looking a little skeptical. Is, I know the wave organs exist. Is that a wave harp? Is that what that is? No. So what we are listening to right now is some music that was created mathematically. Oh, sure. By translating <laughs> visual satellite images taken by NASA into uh, layers of ocean color data and different colors in these satellite images were coded as different parts of the scale and different instruments. And so what this particular sound of the sea is, is uh, the work of these musicians. Uh, Goddard scientist was a co-creator, also Ryan Vandermeulen. And uh, this particular one is Rio de la Plata. And it's the sound of a large river entering a large ocean. Okay. All right. Yeah, they, that's uh, about as convoluted uh, a way to get to that uh, music as they possibly could have found. Yeah, but it's kind of fun. They took, uh, they, it's all data. So this is visual image data that's been transcoded into music to create these, uh, as Vandermeulen calls it, oceanographic symphonic experiences. Yeah, and it's amazing how how like the uh, the Western uh, octave the, that data happened to fall into, I guess. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, I'm it's sure amazing they, how they, that just yeah. happened. Yeah. They, yeah, they assigned really... the various values to things within a specific scale and probably yes. within that even specific chords. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. So that to it make sounded it, good, for sure. So it sounds nice, yes. As it's if you removed to... every key on the piano, except for those in a very specific set, you could make some really beautiful music, too. Yeah, uh, yeah, stop it. But, I, you know, we've talked before about creating sound from different data sets, and people have been trying to make auditory versions of data from the LHC. They've been trying to create, you know, all sorts of auditory ways of imagining things like proteins and this is another another twist and on I've that. I've never liked not? it anytime that they've ever attempted to do any of these things. I just you just need it- to look at it different. Just instead of the ocean made some beautiful music. No, 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 no. The scientists <laughs> made some beautiful music with data yes. that they got from the ocean. That is a okay. different yes. it's a different yeah. spin that perhaps you might enjoy it more. I think it took some beautiful scientific knowledge and some really great musical knowledge to make that piece of art. I think that's it. This piece that's playing in the background right now is um, a piece of the Bering Sea that's representative of uh, photosynthetic bacteria. So we've got blue is the ocean, which is the first base. You can't hear it? No. Oh, did I turn it down? Oh, I, gosh, you know, darn it. You, you know, know what it's I fine. Did? It's fine. It's, I clicked just, it on the wrong screen. Hold uh, on. This yeah. is, this isn't, if, if somebody was to just do an interpretive dance. You could do yes. an interpretive dance. No, this will get cut. Color. I Here would just, no, I know. And I don't enjoy that either. <laughs> so this piece that we're Ooh, I'm bringing in right now, like this is the Bering Sea. And it is representative of the blue of the ocean the green light that emerges from the ocean from the photosynthetic bacteria that's in it. There's also this flute, which is red light that also comes from the ocean. It's reflected from the ocean. So we've got these three instruments, three scales, giving us a visual picture of life in the ocean. 
on our planet Earth. On this Earth Day. Now you can do your imp- imp- your your dancing, Justin. I feel like I'm I feel like I'm in a in a waiting room that I've been waiting in for a long time. A and I and it's not even anything I want to wait for. So it's like, not your music. Uh, That's okay. I think it's very neat. They involved uh so John John Vandermulen, Vandermulen is Dr. Vanda Mullen's brother, and he's a programmer uh, and has experience in digital music production and so helped to do the programming. And they actually made a lot of this on GarageBand. So not even Lovely. using super high tech equipment. So it's anybody could figure out how to do these things. NASA has released a bunch of these videos um, and these musical productions online. So you can go find them wherever you like looking for nasa things Music. i'd love to hear that in a spa i think it would be great yes it would be really nice relaxing spa music oh my goodness but that was like this whole thing of ocean music and we are here to talk about science right so what are we going to talk about today we have a great show ahead i have kombucha on mars i've got zinc in the oceans bacterial brain death and Fun guys. What do you have, Justin? I've got uh, living in the bad place. Uh, some just good news. Some just good news about uh, life. Good news about life. Uh, and a couple of stories about crime. St- uh, I guess one story about crime stopping, and one story that uh, that what you believe in may determine how long you live. May. I believe I will live forever, right? I believe in modern medicine. Is that well? That's that's gonna help. That's gonna help. Yeah, actually. Uh Uh Okay, Blair, what's in the animal corner? Oh, I I just have a whole bunch of World Oceans Day fun. And then um to kick off the show, I have some non-animal news uh about uh women and children. So there you go. They're animals. We're animals. Yes, they certainly are. We're a particular kind. A subset of animalia. Yeah. Human, yes. human animals. But then later on, we'll talk. We'll really get into the salt water. Let's get into the salt water. Go mm-hmm. swimming with the ugly fishes. As we're jumping into the show, I want to remind everyone that if you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us all places that podcasts are found. Look for This Week in Science. We broadcast live streaming weekly on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. You can find us also as Twist Science, T-W-I-S-C-I-E-N-C-E on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram. Our website is twist.org if all of this gets to be too much for you. But if you haven't done so yet, click whatever subscribe button is where you are right now and make sure to sign up for notifications. Science time? Or should science I play more time. NASA? No, NASA, no, no, NASA no, 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 no. Let's get music. Do both. Play the music 90. in the background. Remember that Give we were us talking this about time. doing like a <laughs> fast and efficient show at some point. All right. Well, Justin, you want to take us to the bad place, but I want to give us some good news. So uh, earlier this week, there was news of uh, a very intriguing study suggesting that there is a treatment for rectal cancer that has resulted in complete remission of the patients who have been treated by this therapy. Uh, Matt Stafford sent this email, uh, sent an email and said, I know you don't normally cover cancer, try like covering cancer stuff, because as we've said for years and years and years, it's that the cure, there's no cure. There's so many different Although, forms of the disease. It's all yeah. just out there. Right? Although actually, actually, I feel like more recently we've been doing them because it's been, hey, we have results where it cured a cancer. There's another cancer that's being cured. Where before yes. it was like, oh yeah, opening the pathway to the doorway to yeah. the secret hatch will <laughs> allow us to take a pathway to get a secret, like yeah, MacGuffin that's, after MacGuffin that's on exactly the way it. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what we've ended up with this week is out of Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, this trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine this last week of 12 subjects who were treated using an immunotherapy treatment for rectal cancer. They did not receive chemotherapy, radiation, or any other type of regular cancer 
therapy and the immunotherapy, they've been cancer free. The tumors disappeared, been cancer free for two years. So in this small group of people, this has worked. Why was this so successful? This method is specifically looking at a very small proportion of uh, a subset of the population of people who get rectal cancer. Um, within a group of people, there is a particular mutation that changes the way that corrections can be made. There's a mismatch. Things don't line up and they don't get corrected. But they were able to address that with this immunotherapy that specifically basically goes in and tells the immune cells, no, 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 those are cancer cells. Go kill them. And because the cancer cells, by the time this immunotherapy has been given, have like grown really big and there's a lot of them and they're like, rah, I'm a big cancer cell. Don't look at me. Um, but the, the the immune cells, because of this immunotherapy, they get the blindfold taken off and they go, Psh, you were tricking me. Now I'm going to get you. And they just take them all out and yeah. the cancer disappears. And the uh, in the reports, they said that some people within just two or three of the immunotherapy sessions, which were given about three weeks apart for six months, just within the first two or three therapy sessions, the tumors started to re started to have a reduction in size, and they started to see um, a reversal of their of their symptoms that had sent them to the hospital to the doctors in the first place. So that's just one. And there were two other stories this week as well. Another one related to uh, the BRCA2 gene, where some people who have breast cancer, they have a BRCA2 low is the gene. So they've got the BRCA2 gene, but they've got, only got a very small quantity of the, muta of the mutations in their genes. So not all of the cancerous cells express the BRCA2 phenotype. It's a very low proportion. So they're within this very, very small, again, subset genomic, it's a small group of people, a small genomic subset of the people who get breast cancer and who are even smaller than the group that have the BRCA gene. And with the, with this particular treatment, again, published in New England Journal of Medicine, but all three uh, studies were actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine this last week. Um, and what it, what it, ended up doing was leading to um, the ability of chemotherapy to be able to treat the breast cancer. So previously untreatable breast cancer was suddenly treatable. And then the third one is um, was pancreatic cancer, which can be, it's, it's incredibly deadly. And uh, a patient with progressive metastatic pancreatic cancer was treated with a single infusion of autologous T cells that had been genetically engineered. And so those genetically engineered T cells went and targeted the tumors and the uh, patient is in, is in remission, complete remission as a result. The thing that all three of these studies have in common is genomics and the application of understanding the mutations that are in play and being able to target therapies directly at those, those mutations. This is the future of cancer treatment and the present and the present it's happening right now it's, happening yeah. now. <laughs> it's back to that idea of very personalized health care right and i think that's yeah that's definitely where we're going um it's very cool i will just yeah. throw out there again if if this really works this is great I'm super psyched at the idea of taking care of cancer one by one and, and figuring it all out. I don't know where we're going to put all these people. That is the <laughs> thing that like, especially talking about World Oceans Day, right? And about environmental disaster and about the human population. Mm -hmm. I d this is the conversation we had when I first joined the show too. Like I, I super, on an individual level, I want each sick person to live forever. I want that right. to happen. Yes. But there's always a population part of me that's level. Like, yeah. This was like, this was a big population control. And yes, I understand if you have been touched by someone with cancer, that's a mean thing to say. And I, and I get that. And I, I don't want knowing an individual, I don't want any individual to get cancer. There is this systems thinking that I'm always having. That's where are we going to put all these people? This is, this yeah, is yeah. Well, this is the conversation I tell you what, we're going to have to have this modern baby. 
And then we're just going to have aging populations, Blair. Yeah. It's going to be a go. bunch somebody, of old people is, kicking is, around the old folks' home. You know, it's going to be great. As somebody <laughs> with cancer, I can tell you, I'm, yeah. I'm all for all the cures that they're finding. I find those yeah. extremely important. To, I totally agree that. with you. Completely. I just don't but know where we're right. going to put all these people. <laughs> because, because the results are in. The results are in again. Again. Yeah. Yeah. And uh it looks like uh we are all living in the bad place. No. Carbon levels don't in, be the in the bad place. Carbon levels in the atmosphere have reached an all-time high, as they probably have been doing every couple of years now. But uh carbon dioxide measured at uh, NOAA's uh, Moana Loa Atmospheric Baseline Observatory peaked for two, uh, 2022 at 421 parts per million uh, just this last month, pushing the atmosphere further into territory not seen for millions of years. Millions of years is a mighty long time, but what's most strikingly is how quickly we've uh, we've now gotten to these increased levels. So how long ago do you think it was the uh, last time that we, we were at the over 420 million parts per uh Per million there in the uh, atmosphere. Not, not million parts per million. <laughs> parts per million. Parts per million. 420, 420 parts, parts, parts per, per million. million. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I remember there being uh, mammoths for sure. Oh, it might even be before. Four and a half million years ago mm. is the last time we were over 400 parts per million. All right. 420. So. Yeah. Yeah, so let's put this in a little context. So prior to the Industrial Revolution, CO2 levels were consistently around 280 parts per million. That's for the sort of thousands of years of civilization. This is when we invented agriculture, decided where we would want to live, what we would be eating, and how we would be getting along with each other on the planet at 280 parts per million. A few hundred years later, Industrial Revolution, all this, 420, over 420 parts per million, 50% increase. <clears throat> but what were things like that four and a half million years ago when we were over the 400 parts per million? What, let's step back, shall we, into the days of yesterday. And those good old days, the sea levels varied between five and 25 meters higher than they are today. So a meter, if you're not uh, familiar, is uh, is three times its weight in feet. Ish. Yeah, or the other way around. Yeah, so you got uh, five meters would be a 15-foot sea level rise. Ish, yeah. 25 meters would be about 75-ish uh, meters of sea level rise. There's, there's this fun site, too, that you can go to that shows the effects of sea level rise. Uh, uh, over time, and it only goes up 10 feet. So it doesn't even get sort of like to the minimum of where this carbon level indicates we could be headed quickly. So anyway, that's high enough to write an entire Atlantis-like mythology around many of the world's largest modern cities going forward. Temperatures way back then averaged seven degrees Fahrenheit higher. Large forests covered what uh, we consider Arctic tundra today. And according to uh, NOAA Administrator Rick Spin Spinred, the science is irrefutable. Humans are altering our climate in ways that our economy and our infrastructure must adapt to. We can see the impacts of climate change around us every day. The relentless increase of carbon dioxide measured at Moana Loa is a stark reminder that we need to take urgent, serious steps to become a more climate ready nation yeah if i can kind of take what i was talking about before and and fold it into this i think the the main takeaway that i have is if we could take the same amazing technology that we are putting towards medical care because everyone can agree we don't want sick people and apply that same lens to how we get energy we could actually do a lot of good and accommodate rising populations, longer lived populations, and uh, greater energy requirements. 
without doing this to our planet. But I there's the there's this disconnect, right? Where it's again, everyone can agree illness is bad. Let's well, for the most part, most people can agree how, that we want to <laughs> fix illness. You're yeah. right. This is 2022. I got to adjust. Most. But the the energy conversation has been skewed to become politicized and biased and all this kind of stuff. And so it's not just a simple, okay, we have to we have to f- make this world a place where we can inhabit and grow and thrive for the future, recognizing what our future looks like. And this is the part of climate change information that is often left out is when you talk about, oh, that's way in the future. Oh, it's not real. Oh, oh, it's a it's a political argument. Uh, people don't want big oil, all this kind of stuff. No, this is real life impacts on real life people that we are currently seeing and will very quickly see in the future. And I that's why sea level rise maps are tough because there's a million variables and it's really hard to to say, you know, okay, this is exactly what you're going to see if this, then that. But it's it's the visualization that you need to kind of bring people down to earth and recognize that this is a... Yeah, and oddly that map that you're looking uh, at there, Kiki, is only... Uh, it only goes up to 10 problem. feet, but it also doesn't... It's only in the United States that they've got it. They show the whole <laughs> oh, world map. only the U.S. is going to it, be affected, apparently. It, it's apparent, the National the Oceanic effect. and yeah. Atmospheric yeah. They don't care yeah. what happens elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> They'll all be fine. Let's just all move to Canada. Everyone will be just fine. They'll be fine. Anyway, that's... I was... I was filibustering but essentially this this show yeah we need we need to adjust how we how we make energy <laughs> that's all i'm saying well but the silver mm-hmm. lining we though we the need silver to lining to... yeah yes is of course uh according to you know just even at 10 feet but especially if once it gets over 10 feet of sea rise uh no more florida no, but that's a that's that's physical space where we can't put people anymore. That's yeah. a problem. Yeah, but it's Reducing a physical space. space that seems to have collected people as a block. Uh, but then you want to put okay, them in that's other enough. places. <laughs> <laughs> they're not going away. No, I think they're stubborn uh, enough no. not to move. I think you'll be self-corrected. Yeah, but you know, hey, thanks to the ocean for uh, being the sponge for all this carbon dioxide that we have been releasing into the atmosphere for so long. I mean, that's what our oceans do, right? We have ocean acidification because we've been releasing too much carbon dioxide. More of that in the animal corner. Yes, more to come. Blair, we've been shouting at each other a little bit. We sure have, yeah. Is there a bit of what, noise pollution going on here? How is this going to affect everybody? It's bad for the children okay like (laughs) me no this is is a study from barcelona institute for global health and they wanted to look at schools 38 schools in barcelona and the noise inside and outside of the classroom and how that impacts development of working memory and attention in primary school students they looked at 2,680 children between 7 and 10 years of age. They looked at uh, two abilities that develop rapidly during pre-adolescence and are essential for learning and school attainment. Attention, which is looking at um, selectively attending to specific stimuli or focusing on a specific task, difficult for any human these days, but especially children. And then working memory is the system that allows us to hold information in the mind and manipulate it over a short period of time. They looked over a 12-month period at cognitive tests, and they wanted to see the change over time because children are, are learning very rapidly at this age. They also took noise measurements in um, the 38 schools outside, in the playgrounds, and inside the classroom. And what they found is a noisier classroom is harder for children. It impacts this memory, this attention, um, and as little as a five decibel increase in outdoor noise impacted working memory, uh, made it 11% slower than average, and it made work uh, working memory uh, the complex side of working memory, which is when um, we use the information that we're storing in working memory um, and and kind of use it over time, that was 23% slower than average. 
Exposure to five decibels of outdoor traffic noise also resulted in attention capacity that was about 5% slower than average. So everything was impacted by noise. Hmm. They yeah. also did test, based on um, neighborhood data, the how loud it was in these individual students' neighborhoods. They didn't go measure their individual house, but they measured by neighborhood. And uh, there was no association between residential noise and cognitive development. It was only in the school. So they think that's because school time is when they're having these intense windows of concentration and they're actively trying to learn. And so that is when the noise pollution really gets to them. And I brought this study more just to remind us all that humans are animals and we've talked about noise pollution with animal species a bunch of times, but we haven't really talked about it in relation to humans and specifically children who are impacted by noise pollution. Yeah. I mean, I think that is the really, that's the really important point is we talk about, Oh, how are all of our urban sounds affecting mm -hmm. birds? How are the sounds we make in the oceans affecting whales? Um, but we're not talking about how those environments, I mean, Underwater isn't where humans usually are for the large part, but in our urban environments, yeah. It, that, what impact does noise make on yeah. our abilities? And then also, if you want to get really intense about it, this is not part of the study, but I'm willing to bet money that at least in the United States, if you looked at what schools were the noisiest, it's usually inner cities urban areas, probably public schools before private schools that are in kind of quieter suburban areas. Right. So that can impact specific socioeconomic levels yep. in some places. There's actually a specific um, eth ethnical change, right? Um, that you have specific okay. ethnic eth ethnicity based change. I ethnicity can't find the right based. word, but yes, you'll find certain demographics. That's a better word for this that are put in certain schools in certain areas, whether that's supposed to be the case or not. And if those are more often the loud, busiest parts of the city that could impact academic performance, which later impacts funding, which later impacts all sorts of things. So I'll just throw out there as an extra. So I want, I'm kind just of wondering though. Think about. I'm just wondering what makes the teachers so much worse at teaching once it's loud. Are they just distractible folk? Are teachers people who become teachers like the quiet type people who like? That's oh, not God, what God. it is. I feel like that might be it. I feel like it might just be the teachers get stressed. Blame the out teachers. The yeah, 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 great. Sure, All the teachers sure, listening sure. right now are gonna love that. Hey, take. <laughs> noise can't be good for them either. But no, this I, I've, study I've was about good. the students. The students' performance on tests. Yeah. So. <sighs> That's that's the that's the data we have. And like I bet the Barcelona. band teacher is It wasn't even in the United States, so you know there's you could also throw that variable in there. But it's it's I would say like this is an opportunity to look at those things. Band teacher probably doesn't even know there is out. noise outside. Oh, of course not. They're hard of hearing. I mean, that's why I <laughs> I can't hear very well oh, at drums. all. It's because I sat in front of the tuba player for ten years. So it's yeah. you know. Oompa, oompa. Oompa. Oh, but do you like drinking kombucha? No. No. <laughs> Justin, no, no NASA space music, no, no <laughs> kombucha, <laughs> no interpretive no. dance. <laughs> it's the, Blair, are you it's a kombucha drinker? No, I don't no. like okay. the this, this team is not big on kombucha, but I know there are a bunch of people out there in the world who enjoy yes. it. Well, Kombucha has a, the mother, right? This is the, uh, the bacteria and yeast combination. Is, is that the SCOBY? That ferments. Is that the what SCOBY. that is? Okay. Yes. The mother, the SCOBY, the, uh, the microbial ferment, microbial life that allows for the fermentation that allows for the kombucha to be the beverage, uh, that, that people decide to drink. Um, some people call it tea fungus, mushroom mm -hmm. tea, just yeah, out of you, yeah, you give it yeah. uh, you give it that red tea and sugar uh, to feed it. And then you get the big pellet uh, floating on the top there. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah it's terrible. 
<laughs> Published this week in Frontiers in Microbiology, some uh, international researchers, including the University of Göttingen, I don't know, Göttingen, Göttingen, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, and I apologize. Make all, make all the uh, consonants, vowels, and all the vowels consonants, and you'll have it perfect. <laughs> Göttingen. <laughs> uh, anyway, these researchers sent kombucha cultures to the International Space Station, and uh, they wanted to find out how robust kombucha microbes actually are and whether or not cellulose in particular uh, can be a, a biomarker for, uh, can be a ro robust biomarker. So they sent it up to space brought it back down after one and a half years in simulated Mars-like conditions. So up not just to the International Space Station, but simulated Mars on the International Space Station. And then they let them sit and cultivate for a couple of years. And then they decided to see if they could reactivate them after two and a half years. And they found that those microbial species that contained bacterial cellulose survived, whereas those without cellulose did not. This suggests that uh, microbes with cellulose could live on Mars, but it also suggests that uh, bacterial cellulose could be a biomarker, which means a signal for extraterrestrial life that we look for on other planets and moons in the universe. Anyway, yeah, kombucha on Mars, or at least part of the SCOBY will make it to Mars anyway, the mm -hmm. cellulose part. Bet you didn't know if you're drinking kombucha that your kombucha could survive in space. That makes sense. It looks like an alien. <laughs> well, and and uh, you'll know, probably have good company when once it gets there. Tardigrades. So, uh, yeah, that too. <laughs> What kind so of company, got, Justin? So yeah. Just Good News uh, is the Just Good News uh, science news segment that seeks out the good news despite the future being completely entirely doomed. Origin of life edition. Life. Uh, question is, is it uniquely an earthling-oriented fluke occurrence? An intergalactic oopsie of one-off chemistry. An unlikely, improbable Improbable even freak outlier in a universe big enough to run the numbers on odds till the nil to impossible actually happens. Or is it something so basic, so natural to the underpinning of chemistry in our universe that it is likely to be absolutely everywhere? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. You like the everywhere? Except, except when what it do dies. You think? Where? Yeah. It's you're it's going everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, I guess the, you guys got it right. That's the correct <laughs> answer. Ding, ding, ding. So uh, this is scientists at the foundation for applied molecular evolution have made a discovery that uh, may have answered our question about that once and for all. First, the premise of the debate, uh, the structure of RNA is sort of considered the underpinning. You kind of have to have the RNA structure before you even get to a DNA structure because RNA is like half a DNA. You, how do you get the, you, you know, it's the building block for a DNA to, to in the first place. And they've been looking at how these molecules might form. And, you know, we've had all sorts of elaborate, get those base components and some chemistry in some very synthetic ways and adding electricity and trying to recreate the way that life may have formed. So this RNA uh, was found to spontaneously form on basalt lava glass. This is published online in the journal Astrobiology. Uh, the, the uh, what was it? Uh, Lisa Biondi, the lead researcher. Study shows that long RNA molecules, 100 to 200 nucleotides in length, form when uh, when you don't do, when you do nothing more than when these uh, nucle nucleoside triphosphates do nothing more than percolate through basaltic glass. This is glass that would have been abundant on the earth 4.35 billion years ago. 
And similar results of this antiquity survive today on Mars. Because of what the basalts are made of and how they form, this lava glass rock is likely everywhere that has planets with water and volcanic activity. Since there is no indication of weird physics or different chemistry in other solar systems or in other galaxies, life and the building blocks for the existence of life are likely freaking everywhere out there. Like everywhere. Anywhere that has, so yeah, so anywhere with volcanic activity or the conditions mm -hmm. that could lead to the glassification mm -hmm. of these basaltic rocks. Yeah, so this, and but this is bonded, bonded but RNA. it's not just basalt, right? It's the, it's, it's, it's the, the glass, like the glassy form, like this. Right. Yeah, this is what they uh, they found that it is forming on just naturally percolating from it. Uh, so this barn, this is the Why? bonded RNA though, not the fully double helical DNA that makes up advanced light. And the debate, debate over that the status of RNA uh, viruses uh, being a life form aside, the double helix is uh, is a lot like any of the other discussions on life. We live on a planet where we are adapted. To which, which uh, so it seems like this can be meant for us. If we weren't adapted to it, we wouldn't be here. The double helix is the stable adaptation of RNA. It's a structure the, in, that in a solution is bound and wound in such a way as that it can't get pulled apart in either direction. This way, mm -hmm. lengthwise, it still stays together. That doesn't mean that there's a, a persistence towards it in any, any form of evolution. But the fact that once it's together, it's hard to separate, makes it the thing that's adapted and makes it the thing that persists. So that structure of double helical DNA, very much like ours, also then could very likely be throughout the... So it's not just viruses <laughs> throughout the universe. It could be life. But this does... Being, being the RNA synthesis on these rocks, though, I mean, that does kind of support the the RNA hypothesis right where RNA life is yeah. maybe the the primary stepping stone and then maybe to the more complex DNA and yeah, so yeah. but so, some of those those building block steps those also are, are involved in this so uh, the impacts into that uh, early stage earth also would have delivered nickel which the team showed gives the nucleoside triphosphates from uh, nucleosides and act, they give them an activated phosphate is added into mm. this. Uh, also, if there's borate, borax, uh, also part of the basalt controls the, the form, formation of those triphosphates. So like all of the basic chemistry is there in an early planetary form. Right. The beauty okay, of so this too is this, this method is so uncomplicated. They can actually create a, high schooler with ruler recreation for the classroom. That's cool. Yeah. I think that's going to be, those are going to be experiments that high school science teachers are going to be using college science, science teachers also, but that's amazing. That's a really neat demonstration. RNA from nature. Yes. I'm going to do it at home. Spontaneous, spontaneous generation. Yeah. And I said, I said basalt earlier and I meant like, the igneous rocks that get turned into the basalt that yeah anyway i misspoke but um lava rocks lava life it's mm -hmm. true we need heat we need fire for life we also need zinc for life in our polar oceans according to a new study that has uh just been published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. 46 researchers, international team, five countries came together and uh, were looking at uh, levels of nutrients, levels of compounds in the polar oceans to determine um, how the ecosystems got started and what maintains ecosystems. And so their findings discovered, their findings showed that the polar oceans, they're very, very productive, but they would not be if they didn't have zinc. Zinc, which is like a, you know, a, 
Like it, it's when you take a supplement, it's like the last thing on the list and you're like, oh, zinc. Does it have zinc? Okay, it's got zinc, whatever. We don't really think about it. But in terms of the nutrition for photosynthetic algae in the polar oceans, they evolved to rely on zinc for their life processes. And so uh, the researchers say this evolution appears to have enabled these primary producers to cope with the challenging conditions of polar surface oceans. So challenging conditions, if you think about it, polar oceans, half the year, or at least for a part of the year, they're in limited sunlight. The other part of the year, they're in massive amounts of sunlight. The oceans are also very, very cold. So they're in very cold water with limited light at uh, different times of the year. Um, and so this is very challenging, you can think of, for you know, anything to survive. So they came up with ways to do that. Without zinc, we would have no algae, in turn, no fish, and then no other marine animals. Zinc appears to have driven the evolution of complex life in polar oceans. Hmm. So it's just a fascinating thing, which is this one linchpin that is an afterthought on like our, our, our nutritional supplements, right? Oh, zinc's in my cereal. That's great. Whatever. So I take my zinc when I feel like I'm getting sick and that's supposed to boost my vitamin C, right? It's to help your immune system. Yes. It's good for your immune system. And it's yes. good for the oceans. So, totally and then I take my Alka-Seltzer when my tummy hurts. And that's basically calcium carbonate, which is what makes all shellfish, <laughs> corals, <laughs> all of it. Yep. So it's I'm just I'm just consuming the building blocks of the ocean as yes, my pharmaceuticals. Are. That's interesting. All my over the counters get from well, the ocean. Yeah, yeah, that's you know it's it's uh, our heritage. Is, yeah, is, certainly. Is, as is consumers, right? As is the yeah. ocean. The we depths. are we are we are creatures of the sea. Mm -hmm. Truth, truth there. Uh, and I guess nobody knows exactly how zinc got to be the linchpin. We don't really understand the cycling of zinc in the polar surface oceans yet, but more studies to come. Zinc, vital, important. All right, but what are we missing, Blair? You want to oh, tell man. us something here? That you know what's vital on? or important <laughs> is for your healthcare provider to tell you if there are counterindications when you are being administered a drug. Uh, this is a study right. from the European oh, Society of Anesthesiology right. and Intensive Care, and it was specifically looking at the use of the drug su Sugamadex, Sugamadex, something like that, which is used in anesthesia. It's administered toward the end of the operation, which uh, right before the, the patient is, is brought back, is woken up, and it reverses the action of drugs given earlier in the procedure to relax muscles. The thing is, Sugamadex. I would never, I would always turn down this drug if every time my doctor tried to say it, they were like, yeah, <laughs> so we're going to get I'm that. A, I can't say it. Like, yeah, it, it might have been I don't feel like the, you know, you know, that one well enough. Massive yeah. debt and many years of schooling and Why don't you disinterest leave the room, in medicine. Practice to, it two or three times me. and then come in and pitch it to me again. Because yeah. right now I, I, I lack confidence in this drug you can't even pronounce. Right. So, so here's the thing, Justin, in most cases, they don't tell you you're getting Sigma Dex. <laughs> Maybe this is why, but anyway, um, it's, Dex. It's, it's known to interact with hormones in your body, specifically progesterone, which means it reduces like the, the effectiveness that, of uh, progesterone well pills, which is hormonal birth control, yeah. uh -huh. the combined pills, vaginal rings, implants and IUDs, basically all of it <laughs> that isn't condoms, essentially, as I'm probably missing, I guess, diaphragms, but anything that's like hormone based mm -hmm. contraceptives have impacts from this drug that I will not say again. And the current <laughs> guidance is to let your patient know if it is a woman of childbearing age, WCBA, <laughs> you should, that they have received this drug and it increases the risk of contraceptive failure, which means those who take oral hormonal contraceptives have to follow the missed pill advice on the leaflet, which how many people keep the leaflet? You probably have to figure that out together. And then those that have contraceptives that um, are non-orally taken have to use non-hormonal means 
of contraception for seven days following treatment. Uh, okay. Pa- yes. Can I pause this for a sec? I, yes. I, I, because I, it was having so much fun with the name of the drug. I forgot yes. why anybody was taking it in the beginning. In the it is place. part of Anis. Aesthetics. Okay, so you're gonna they're gonna put you out. You're gonna have a tooth removed or a kidney replaced, or, or emergency happening. surgery, emergency or surgery. elective surgery, or any number of things. Right. And th- but then the next day, you're still healthy enough to have sex. Yes. And your birth control is not working because this drug is interfering with the hormones. Exactly. Or how situation. about this? Maybe you had sex right before you got into an accident. That could be how the accident happened. Surgery. It could be There's a, a sex-related accident. Okay? Humans have sex. These things can happen. Sometimes people okay? get hurt. They need so, to go to the th- so this means that this is really important. So researchers administered a seven-question survey to um, all uh, anesthetists the G- theologists about 150 <laughs> professionals i can't do it today oh, i got there. three syllable words only today <laughs> Mark's mouth is not working today. no it's not it's fine you know what i'm talking about I so 150 you. professionals took this survey 94 percent of the 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 doctors that responded the practitioners <laughs> said they were aware of the risk of contraceptive failure 94 percent so not not a hundred percent, but very high. Seventy percent, almost all of them. Seventy percent said they do not routinely discuss this drug with the patients who receive it. Seventy percent. So then they took a survey of two hundred and thirty four patients who were administered this drug during the six weeks covered by this audit. Twenty eight percent of the patients given this drug were of childbearing age. And 48 of these should have received advice. That means the other 17 had medical history that meant they weren't at risk of pregnancy. Any number of reasons, right? But so 48 of these people could have had an accidental pregnancy because of contraceptive failure. But there was no... That they would have never but never known about. And they wouldn't have known why their contraceptive failed. And they would have been like, oh, what? Wait. Yeah. There was no record on yeah. any of the 48 charts that they were talked to yeah. about it. No record so, at all. So were there any pregnancies? They did not follow this to that level. They were just looking at this survey to see, are doctors talking to them about it, okay? Yeah. And so in response to the findings, the authors created a patient information leaflet, sure, and letters, sure, um, but they're programmed to the electronic patient record system to identify quote unquote, at risk patients and deliver electronic prompts to the practitioners caring for them to talk to them about it. So it's kind of like if you, I know I've seen it. It's like, and- it's like a notification to their to their tablet as they're going around and making their rounds. Oh, Miss Blair, yes. we must inform you. Uh, it says here that Sugar Mama Dex is going to sugar make you mama. a sugar mama. Yes. So th- this is the thing, right? Is it's just, it's like, um, I've seen a point of sale system at stores that say like, have you smiled? Did you ask them how their day was? Like, we're having yeah. to do this now with these practitioners. I don't know if this is because it just doesn't occur to them. I don't know if this is because it's a delicate subject they don't want to bring up. I don't you know just what's have a lot going to think on. About. Well, but you know, ultimately, this is a yeah. problem for a couple reasons. Uh, the main one that I'm thinking of is that we now are in a situation in the United States where this mistake could cause someone to carry an unwanted pregnancy. Uh, yeah. Okay. That brings it home. Yep. So Got this it. was the thing mm-hmm. where I read this and I went, oh no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is a big problem because it adds a whole extra level of, yep. of danger there. Um, which danger, is really responsibility. Scary. Yeah. And who's Absolutely. responsible in that case? Yeah. And here's yes. the thing. I, I think, I think you've kind of pinpointed the, the thing with that smile and all the information you're supposed to say. If you, if you go to, uh, if you go to a pharmacist, a pharmacy and you buy something from a pharmacist, you buy it over here and then you scoot down to the counter, you pay over it, scoot down. And then somebody sits there and like reads you half of the, the indications and warnings is like, mm-hmm. Hey, if you, if you, uh, if you do this, if you drive, if you don't, uh, you know, whatever it is, don't stand on your head for the next 24 hours while you're taking this. Otherwise, you'll get really dizzy. And they read you all this stuff. 
But if you get one of those anesthesiologists, uh, yeah. they're, they're more like, well, you're going to feel a warm and tingly feeling. And then you're going to sleep. And that's kind of where they leave it. They don't get, go into a whole lot of details about what they're giving you. They're just knocking you out and they're moving on. So I, I wonder if they have to like adopt the same sort of, just get the, get the pharmacist, call them up from the, from the pharmacy and have them come up yeah. to the operating room and give you the little spiel before they put you out. But if it's an emergency, who's got time? It's, I mean, it's the tough thing is you tell people after the fact. Yeah. Or you, you tell say, them hey, when you're sure talking about from here discard. on out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And there and needs to be, a, it needs to be in there somewhere. I, I feel like it, people are going to think that's a lie. If your anesthesiologist is telling you, you know, <clears throat> sometimes this drug leads to being people being pregnant, you're going to be like, what just happened while I was unconscious? <laughs> <laughs> Yikes! I hate that, Justin. No, thank you. It's not no. so gross. That's probably why they're not saying anything. <sighs> That's not why. It, but ultimately, <laughs> the thing is, uh, this is a reminder to all humans who are of childbearing age who could bear children. Yeah. Um, to ask questions, no matter how insane it sounds, when you're being prescribed something, are you going through a medical treatment? I guess you gotta ask every time. You have are to. Are there your own any advocate. contraindications? And Will you anything and you might have to be very specific. I am on anything. hormonal birth control. How does this <laughs> impact this treatment? Because yeah. I know, as a as like a twenty something, I didn't know that antibiotics uh, was a counterindication for or has had um, interactions with um, hormonal birth control. I didn't know that. I found yeah. that out after the fact, freaked out. Everything was fine. But ultimately, that was something that I didn't get told when I was prescribed the antibiotics because I'm just expected to figure that out on my own. This is a really good opportunity to say, ask every time because the body is a system and things are connected that you could never think are connected. You got to be your own advocate, which is a bummer. But here we are. You playing me off? Now, this is the sound of anesthesia uh, working on a patient. This is the sound of chlorophyll. Oh. And this. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us for another fun-filled science episode focused on the oceans. If you're loving what we're doing right now, give us a like. And if you like us enough to give us a like, tell a friend and bring a friend next week. We are canceling COVID this week. We're not going to talk about any COVID news. So it is time to play us directly into that part of the show, which this week is all about these oceans and what lives in them. It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. I turned the music down. Oh, oh that's out. Sounds oh, funny. Was that? Hey, that was on. that combination of ocean chlorophyll sounds and the uh, yeah. animal corner. I don't know what's going on. It's all confused. It's all weird. Oceans. Okay, I can do that again. Hold on, folks. Don't we know this song well enough? Can't you sing it, Blair? I can. No. Oh. It's Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creature, great and small. Buy a pet, mill a pet, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? It's a World Oceans Day. Blair's Animal Corner. I'm going to start by telling you all about ugly fish and how they need our help. I love ugly fish. I like all the ugly, ugly things. If you love them, are they still ugly? I, I, I guess probably, huh? Anyway, um, according to a machine learning study, they are. <laughs> this is from the University of Montpellier, France. Pronounce that. Uh, they asked 13,000 members of the public to rate the aesthetic attractiveness of 481 photographs of ray-finned fishes in an online survey. Then they used that data to train a neural network. Then they used that neural network to generate predictions for additional 
4,400 photographs featuring 2,417 of the most encountered reef fish species to label them as ugly or not. So the neural network decided if a fish was ugly or not. What they found because was that we, we totally trust neural networks. Oh, sure. <laughs> to be unbiased in these kinds of things. But yeah, okay. Sure, it's fine. Uh, bright, colorful fish with rounder bodies tended to be rated as the most beautiful. Species that were ranked as more attractive also tended to be less distinctive in terms of their ecological traits and evolutionary history. So a really kind of more uniform group were considered pretty fish. They all kind of had similar ecological roles. Species listed on the IUCN red list uh, they uh, that as threatened or whose conservation status has not yet been evaluated, which just means they're really rare, so they haven't been able to address that, had lower aesthetic values on average. So that means there was a mismatch between aesthetic value, ecological function, and extinction vulnerability. The pretty fish were the ones that don't need our help. And the ugly fish were the ones who do, both by the number of them left and by how important they were to their ecosystem. Interesting. So that also means that it is likely that the species most in need of public support are least likely to receive them. Are the pretty ones, I mean, when I think of like the pretty fish, I think yes. of the ones that are living in the coral reefs and they're the ones that we have all the videos of. And so they're the mm -hmm. ones that the tourists are looking at. But when it comes to like fishing, we're, we're, we're fishing for the quote unquote ugly species. Yes. And so that's another really important part is that those that are most important to humans in fisheries also are considered more ugly. <laughs> so that, that means generally the fish, fish that are more important. Yes, rockfish, uh, a lot of trout. Yeah, I think you can look at trout and salmon and they, they are very pretty in certain lights, but they are not considered as pretty as, for example, clownfish or surgeonfish. Unless you're hungry. Fish. Well, it, you're a pretty so, good looking fish to eat. Yeah. So, Sorry. so I mean... <laughs> Okay, I am I am befuddled uh, and bemused that they have an attractiveness scale as any of this. But we're talking about uniformity uh, amongst fish that are surviving. And a more diverse style of fish is the one that is struggling, generally speaking. But also more important ecologically. Okay. Huh. Which would indicate that well, prior to humans, that probably was not the case. Yep. Uh, but the, I guess I guess if you have a bunch of fish who were structurally similar, they might also have a similar diet or similar habitat or similar similar similarness. And so, if there's enough you of those to fill the niches, then yeah, they're not as important. So, I mean, the problem with this is that it only looked at reef fish, and the coral reef mm -hmm. in general is an endangered habitat. Yeah. Okay. So it kind of impacts the scale of this study in any broad niche-based conversations we could have, the, like the one that you're talking about. It's kind of limited because they focused on reefs. If we looked at the ocean as a whole, I'd agree with you. There could be some more, there could be some more uh, conclusions we could draw. But ultimately, what this means is that there is a mismatch in the inherent value and the actual ecological value. This is common in conservation it's the panda principle panda v snake right yeah. panda v yeah. spider panda v shark all those situations landmark panda... landmark case panda yeah v shark. it's considered <laughs> cuter more attractive what have you but you also think about how humans are hardwired and um there's there's a weird there's a weird aspect of this where all of the quote unquote like beautiful fish look very similar you could probably look at some weird human naturey things about that in relation to human on human beauty standards too it's interesting i don't know but Humans ultimately want to be birds yes we, we like the pretty feathered birds we yes. like the nice colors we wish mm -hmm. we had all that yeah <laughs> but so this world oceans day give some love to the ugly fishes that's all i ask I will. I will, Blair. Yeah. 
Thank you know you. who who loves fishes of all types? Who? Uh, otters they like to eat oh, them they otter eat them yeah mm -hmm. university of exeter wanted to look at asian short clawed otters and how they learn things from each other uh, they gave them puzzle boxes containing familiar food and then they gave them unfamiliar natural prey the meat inside which was protected by hard outer shells so this two very different distinct scenarios you have you're used to the food inside but I want you to solve a puzzle to get to it. And then here is a novel food source in a novel puzzle, but it is natural. So we can mimic what would happen in the wild, right? The otters watched each other to decide whether food was safe and desirable. So they would watch one otter eat and go, okay, that, that looks doable. That looks delicious. I'm going in. But they would not copy the problem solving skills from the otter they observed. They would use their own wits, not the example of others, to figure out how to extract the items from the protection. Uh, so basically what this means is that they have social learning, but that it's limited in its nature. Um, they gave them five variations of a puzzle box, each with a meatball, which was their familiar food. The method to extract the food varied in each version. And then the natural prey were rainbow trout as a control. They're not hard on the outside. And then shore crabs and blue mussels. There were 20 otters in the study. 11 managed to extract the meat from all three types of natural prey. Um, but they showed that they could learn how to do it. They, what really is interesting is that for conservation, if you want to release an Asian small clawed otter, if you teach them to eat specific prey in the wild via another otter, they will they will take that up, take it out into the wild. And most likely, other otters will follow suit. So if you want to teach otters to eat a new prey because their old prey is depleted, for example, you can do that. But you're not going to be able to teach them how to do it. They have to figure that out on their own. Yeah. So it's really interesting that they mix it and they're not just learning everything from other otters. They're like, right. I got to do some stuff by myself. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to work through this so that I know how to do it, but I can also watch you over there and mm -hmm. get some ideas. Yeah. And you know, there's probably something to be said about the fact that they're carnivores, they're hunters. Uh, they also compete over territory and they have mm. quite the tool set. They have amazing teeth and claws and so they they have to use all that to stay kind of evolutionarily fit. So maybe it's a weird way to keep, keep their skills kind of up throughout this so that they don't get kind of, you know, used to the same thing. I don't know. Well, it's also, it, it, I mean, having that kind of, there's learning from others, but then, you know, so that habits can get passed down, but that it's not just habit and it's not just only learned you can actually have flexibility to new situations. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when something arises that the habit doesn't fit, there's that resilience built into the system. Yeah. yeah. And weasels really are, otters are in the weasel family and they're, they're very good. They're, they're, they're generalists. They will eat yeah. anything they can catch pretty much. So including humans. Yes. True. <laughs> anyway, I see uh, Last, I want to talk about the um, unsung hero of the ocean, kelp. Let's sing it. How sing do you it, sing about kelp? Kiki? I think, I, I think I Kiki played it. it earlier. I think that was the... <laughs> go, kelp. Anyway. Kelp, um, I need somebody. Oh, somebody. Kelp, oh, not just anybody. <laughs> you got it. That is the one. Geniuses. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Not sorry. Kelp. They can help with ocean acidification. They can kelp with ocean acidification. Um, they, it makes sense. They're photosynthesizing. So they convert carbon dioxide to oxygen. So the yes. more kelp there is, the better for the ocean it is. With this study from the Stony Brook University School of Maine and, or marine and atmospheric sciences tells us is that the presence of kelp significantly reduces ocean acidification nearby 
which actually has a direct impact on bivalves like clams and oysters. So all three of these things, kelp, clams, and oysters, are aquaculture items. So this study shows essentially that by diversifying aquaculture, you can help your own crop by um, protecting the shell fisheries from ocean acidification. And um, it, of course, it you know it offers a second crop that you can you can harvest and sell as well. So um, the the kelp that they looked at is actually called uh, sugar kelp is the is the common name for it. And that's used in food. It's not it's not like nori or, or seaweed, but it's um, it's used as ingredients in foods like like soups and other processed mm -hmm. foods. That's where we get things like carrageenan. Mm -hmm. And it's probably. a yeah, it's a yeah. sugar alternative to. So, yeah. So anyway, thickener. yeah, mm -hmm. it's a thickener. Yep. You're totally right. And so um, the the kelp in oyster farms uh, has a direct impact on the the bivalves that are directly in and around that kelp the ones just a little bit farther away had larger impacts from ocean acidification so this is uh this is a real strong they did it in the lab first and then they they tested it out in real aquaculture facilities and so um it's yeah it's a great proof of concept that that the kelp really has a positive impact on the environment and algae's all over the ocean have a huge impact because they're uh, they're the primary producers. <laughs> so they're like the trees of the ocean. And so um, their impact, they reduce ocean acidification. They feed the the primary consumers who then feed the secondary consumers and blah, 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 right? You know, your food web. But um, this is kind of, this is this is proof that protecting kelp protects the oceans. And one of the things I was thought of, I thought about recently was the the sea otters. Speaking of otters in Monterey, and how when the sea otters were hunted out, it actually destroyed the the kelp forests because without sea otters to eat the urchins, the urchins overate the kelp, and then the kelp kind of collapsed, and that changed the yeah. landscape. And so we called the sea otters the keystone species, but in a way. You could look further down the line and say the kelp was right because right. the kelp was creating an environment and the entire ecosystem, the direct chemistry of the ocean around it. There was a there was a story from a couple of weeks ago that uh, it, I don't think anybody brought, but it was about uh, I think a, I think it might have been like Michigan or something. They have this I plan to get rid of a lot of the algae, clear up the water, and then they've done some modeling and said, yeah, actually all these like terrible cyanobacteria will take over the lake. It'll become a, yeah. you'll, you'll get rid of the toxic algae with a, but, a toxic bacteria yeah. will take its place because it's been yeah. keeping it down. So boy, when you mess with a, with a biome in any way that's been established, you really don't know what you're doing. Right. But <laughs> it's, the, the cool thing about this is um, just like when you think about farming crops on land, crop rotation is important diversification is important because you don't want to deplete resources and you you don't want to um have all these kind of detrimental impacts of um, monoculture the same is true for aquaculture and this is a really good proof of that that you want to have diversification of your um crops in aquaculture as well for a bunch of reasons but this is a really big one if we promoted the 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 growing of kelp in aquaculture as a general rule no matter what type of fish or shellfish was being raised in that area it could clean the water and reduce ocean acidification from the and the it might actually for for a lot of fish species i mean not necessarily the ones where they aquaculture them out in open ocean but if you're doing aquaculture in shore areas that have a lot of the that wouldn't normally have kelp these species that are there are probably going to be feel safer they'll have lower mm -hmm. stress hormones they might experience fewer behavioral disruptions and have a, diff a whole different way of interacting with each other if you have a more naturalistic environment for that aquaculture that is a really good point i didn't even think about yes so that's yeah absolutely 
So this is a, a good reminder that, you know, we're, we're in an open system. It's not a closed system. Even when you do aquaculture out on land, that water has to go somewhere. So if you can reduce, mm -hmm. d reduce acidification in that water, whether it's yeah. part of a, um, an open system or a closed system, that's going to impact the world as a whole. So more kelp. <laughs> kelp, the oceans. With kelp. Dun, dun, dun. That was Justin's brain on interpretive dance. This is This Week in Science. If you are enjoying the show, and I hope that you are, please head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. Head over there to support us in an ongoing fashion. To keep this show going, our listeners do support us and keep keep us doing the show every week. It's really you, the listener, who makes this show possible through your support on Patreon. $10 a month and more. We will thank you by, by name at the end of the show. And uh, if you're not interested in Patreon, just remember we do have Zazzle as well. There's a lot of cool merchandise out there, twist t-shirts and other things that proceeds go to uh, help the show. So all of that, we really thank you because we can't do this without you. Thank you for your support. All right, Justin, you got some stories for us? Yeah, there's a uh, new paper uh, in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is not the sort of thing I normally pay very close attention to. This is published by Oxford University Press. They found that taking away welfare from children when they reach the age of 18 greatly increases the chances that they will face criminal justice charges in subsequent years. So... There's supplemental uh, a security income in the United States is a program that would provide payments or does provide payments to people with disabilities who have low income. These are uh, children qualify for the program based on their disability status and their parents' low income and assets. Until 1996, when there was a uh, conservative resurgence of political power in the United States, children automatically continue to qualify for the adult program when they turned 18. Uh, 1996, they phased that out. So when you turned 18, they used the adult model, which was, I guess, more restrictive. And about 40% of children who had been receiving benefits when they turned 18 no longer were. So by comparing records of these children uh, in the differing outcomes, they found that it, there was an increase of 20% number of criminal charges over the next two decades and a, an annual likelihood of incarceration of 60 percent which is pretty amazingly high and uh, most of the crimes that these kids would end up uh, getting into had to do with what's called income generating crimes things like theft burglary fraud forgery and prostitution and again these are children who went from the outset had uh, conditions mental and behavioral conditions that qualified them for these programs. So what the uh, economists did here was they looked at what did it cost in the increased uh, crime and the increased incarceration versus having just given them the supplemental income. Turns out, if you just look at the cost of the crime, the courts, the policing, and the incarceration, it's about the same. But then you're taking away, you're not including all of the other things like, well, if they had a better start and were getting jobs and paying taxes, they would have actually been adding to as not opposed to it. So if the outcome is you want less taxes and more efficient government, better outcomes for individuals, lower crime rates, better jobs, better pay, better economic status, allowing young people with disabilities a safety net, that, that could be part of your solution. It's one of those it also sounds weird... Yeah, it sounds like a, a pretty easy solution. I mean, but it's the it's the whole part of, you know, in the United States, people have been arguing against welfare. You don't want to, you don't want the nanny state. You don't, you know, but this kind of data does sure. yeah, to help support how welfare, how support can keep people from going down the path of crime because it maintains their ability to do the things that 
you know, they don't feel like they, they, you don't feel like you need to do crime, right? Well, there's that. And I there's can also, feed my family. I can, there's I also have some rent. of the, the things yeah. that aren't in this study. And it just as a, for instance, whether you're talking about general assistance, welfares, uh, specific ones like the SSI supplements like this, food stamps, 100% of the money that you put towards that as your government and your community stay very local to where those dollars are spent. Yeah. Those right. are staying here. If you give a, a corporation a tax incentive thing or whatever, and they're going to build a bigger factory overseas, none of that money is coming. None of that is helping anybody. Any of these general systems. And then say, say you even buy into the Kool-Aid that there's some people who just don't want to work and are willing to live on that safety net money, that bare minimum amount of money. Fine. That's less people in the workforce. You know what that means? More job opportunities for you that they're wanting to work. And it means you're probably going to be able to get a better income because there's less people who are just taking any job to survive and are willing to be paid anything because they absolutely need it just not to die. Right? Like there's, there's benefits beyond even just the peripheral. But this is disabled children turning yeah. into young adults and getting cut off by the safety net. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Anyway. But even from, you know, from the, just from the, the, the basic argument that maintaining welfare as these, these people become, go into adulthood, maintaining welfare reduces crime. Yeah. There you so go. So people would Safer like community. less crime in your local area, welfare yeah. <laughs> programs mm. help with that. <laughs> I don't want to pay for it. That's, oh, that's well, the, that's, you're going to pay for it. That's the conclusion I'm taking from this. Well, see, that sounds like a very obvious path forward. Lower, lower, lower uh, crime and lower uh, lower yeah. taxes. They actually, they'll go hand in hand into a, in a, to a better society. So okay. that leads me to my next story, which is what you believe in might kill you quicker. Oh, no. What you believe uh, actually politically determines when you will die. This is a uh, landmark case here. Uh, the political landscape is full of issues. We've got the, or at least concepts that are that are called issues. Usually, they're not actually the issues. They're not having nothing to do with policy. They're more things that people have been coerced to be for or against without having to look any further into it. Often, these concepts are built uh, to generate donor engagement. Uh, while there may actually be issue of policy somewhere down the line in the rabbit hole somewhere. Politics is often not seen very clearly in terms of the outcomes, like we were talking about just now, about the outcomes of, of the government shutting down uh, a welfare program and then ending up paying for it anyway, right? If you just look at outcomes, which is what we should be doing, we should ignore all rhetoric. Whenever they've got politicians on there talking about a policy, they should ignore everything that they're saying. And look at the outcomes of when those policies have been in place before. We have had plenty of time to do this. So this could be a conversation about guns. Uh, states with least gun regulation have the most gun deaths. So if you're talking about safety, you should say, I'm against safety. That's why I'm against gun regulation. It could be uh, social safety nets, which we were just talking about. It could be about wealth inequality, education, worker safety. Any number of issues, but this is a study. Climate change. Years, <clears throat> climate change, absolutely. This is a re recent study that looked at one outcome, mortality, and correlated it with red and blue voting leaning counties. Conservative versus liberal. Democrat versus Republican. It's a 20-year study. It looked at that correlation found that between 2001-2019, mortality rates decreased by 22% in Democratic counties. In that that's same time frame, that's significant. And they decreased in Republican uh, counties, too, by 11%. That's a 50% more decrease in death in blue counties nationwide. So that's sort of interesting. From the beginning to the end, though, there seems to be an increase in this thing. From the beginning to the end, the gap between them increased 541%. What? Yeah. 
So they, they started actually 20 years ago. They weren't that far apart. The red uh, con- government controlled areas, the blue control uh, controlled areas. Some of the things that we've added since then, like uh, the Affordable Care Act, mm-hmm. are have been yeah. rejected and not implemented in some of those red communities. But they have and... impacted health coverage and so mortality mm-hmm. in places that have yeah. enacted it yeah yeah and that's one, one of the things there's a bunch of factors yeah. involved uh so if we're looking for so we have this better technology we're curing diseases all the things we're getting we're getting more and more access to it's happening at half the rate uh, that those increases in uh decreasing mortality the decreases in mortality are happening at half the rate in red controlled areas. so which if your politics and policies or outcomes is a you can say this, there's widespread re- support amongst Republican-leaning American communities for heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, diabetes, influenza, pneumonia, kidney disease, drug overdose, and suicide. That's what they're for. That's what those policies that they're... So I can understand, I can understand then why some of those communities might be very anti-government. If everything, if they don't believe in their government, because it's having terrible outcomes for them locally. (laughs) This is correlation, I will say. Yes. Yeah, they didn't go into causation in the study. They looked at correlation. It's it's interesting, and I think it's worth Mm -hmm. talking about, but I do just want to call out the fact that it is correlation. So there there could be other confounding variables. Mm Mm-hmm. Like red states might be more likely to have other problems or red county, excuse me, that could impact mortality. Hey, yeah, yeah. You know what? That's true, because a lot of those states also have uh, less restrictive gun laws and much higher rates of gun death. That's true. Yeah, there are many factors that. Can go there. There are many factors that go into these kinds of things for sure. Um, I think the point that you brought up the uh, the American uh, Care Act, the the ACA, mm-hmm. being enacted in various places that probably has had a major impact, especially in that time period and toward the end of that time period, significantly. It is good that they stopped measuring it after 2019, though, because the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Those years kind of throw everything into the. Well, you'd have to do a relief. specific COVID yeah. study on those same parameters, <laughs> right? You can't yeah. you can't lump that in with everything else. You'd find probably similar results. But I do I also would, yeah. wonder if it is if it is the ideological attacks on science that are making it uh, people dismiss advice from their doctors. I'm wondering if it is the amount of private. Uh, uh, Private hospitals versus public health public programs. Health, yeah. mm-hmm. You know, like well, there's, there's a, also there's a, an issue, Justin, with a lot of issues. Red states and red counties often being more rural. And so mm-hmm. healthcare so, is usually farther away. That and they did look at this, and actually of the red uh red counties, the more rural they were, the worse the the health outcomes were. Right. They were actually yeah. the worst. Which makes in sense. The, yeah. Mm-hmm. We don't want it to make sense, but it does make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I guess. But this was also a way of doing sort of a, a, a broad look at it because it would be if you tried to point to just the amount of red meat being served uh, in a diner on a given, you know, like drilling down on this will take some time. But there's a pretty clear, pretty clear pattern. Mortality rates are higher under under Republican government. Well, moving away from mortality rates and political beliefs, I'm going to take us into the land of our guts. Taking mm-hmm. us to our, I have, I've got guts. I'm going to take us into our guts right now. Okay. Um, researchers just published in Cell Host and Microbe their study of some metabolites. These are metabolic products of bacteria in the gut. They started this understanding that in the microbiome of humans in the intestines, there's an increase as people age with a certain type of bacteria called ruminococcus. 
Coxacea, C A C A C A, Ruminococcaceae. I think I got mm-hmm. close there. Anyway, it increases and it creates an isoamylamine, IAA. That's its metabolite. This is the thing that it produces. And in elderly people, because there's more of the ruminococciaceae, you have more of the IAAA. And I was like, hmm, what's going on there? We know that some things can affect the brain from the gut. And oh, look, IAAA can cross the blood-brain barrier. So what could it possibly be doing in the brain? Well, they couldn't do all the stuff in the human brain. So this is where they took it to mice. And they uh, looked to see what happened when they grew cultures of neuronal cells and put IAAA in it and what happened. And they're like, oh, IAAA binds a promoter region. This is the part of a gene that tells it to get transcribed. So it makes a, th- makes a gene active and makes it turn into a protein if, it, if it's going to get translated. So when IAAA binds to a particular promoter region in a gene for the P53 regulator, what ends up happening is instructions to cause cell death get printed in the brain's neurons. And so what they discovered is that when they gave IAAA and fed it to mice, those mice had cognitive decline. The IAAA is going from the brain, I mean, from the gut into the brain, telling the brain cells to kill themselves. And then a cognitive decline occurs. They used a compound to block the IAAA in the gut of the mice, and it blocked the cognitive decline. So now I want whatever that compound is in my breakfast cereal. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but it is a fascinating, a fascinating study because they've taken this whole pathway from um, from basic the the metabolite in the gut into the brain and pinned it to actually leading to programmed cell death of neurons. So things in our gut, as we get older, the bacteria, old people gut, get bacteria that make bad stuff, travels to the brain, kills the brain. We go, Bleh. I don't like that. No, we don't want that. Let's make I don't that want, stop. but, but the, the, the cognitive decline was only in mice. It wasn't in people. So it maybe doesn't work the same way in people, but it probably does. I don't know. I feel like that happens when I have like uh, eat two double doubles from in and out, like back to back. I feel like there's <laughs> something from my gut that's like trying to kill my brain so it doesn't happen again. It's, like, it's very possible. It's like, don't ever do this again. My brain is like, oh, that was good. But then I can't move for a little while. Yeah. But anyway, this we now uh, potentially have a target because we know this metabolite. We can either target the bacteria themselves. We can target the metabolite in our guts before it hits the blood-brain barrier. Uh, two potential targets that could potentially benefit the aging brain. So this could could lead good places. Blair, who wants to be living forever? Yeah. It's, does this well. mean that? Um... A, a transplant would help or no a fecal transplant oh maybe if it i mean the question is does would the fecal transplant fix whatever problems are leading to the change in the bacterial composition oh, yeah. in the yeah. first place mm-hmm. right. like it it would, would, just would that just be short con- term or would it, it be a long term mm-hmm. thing yeah yeah, it might just not be generating the the IAA whatever it was it was getting up there and doing the bad stuff. Yeah. So I I would just have to do a wipe. I'd have to go on an intense course of antibiotics and and mm-hmm. take a, a poop pill, like not just any poop pill. Like every Doctor Justin's not a real doctor. Poop pill six months. That sounds doable, right? That sounds terrible. <laughs> sounds terrible. I, I think you could do it about the same length of doing an antibiotic. I think it's like a ten day program. Yeah, yeah, but you have to do it over and over again to prevent your. I don't know. Behavior, I don't right? know. I I don't know because it's not like if you knock out your native population and then filled it up with somebody else's native population, 
It'll still age. It'll, It'll still, still age. age. I mean, but if the if it's the gut, if it's the gut oh lining, God. the 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 gaps mm -hmm. between the cells leading to uh, leaky gut, um, and other you know, there are certain things that change as you get older that aren't necessarily mm -hmm. because of the microbial population. It's all things. Live. <sighs> it's it's a system, Blair. It's yeah. a systems mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get away from our guts. Have you ever thought about? Fungi, yes. I mean, eyes on funguses. Oh, like fungus no. with eyes. No, that <laughs> I have uh, not. Right? Whoever thinks of a mushroom, or you know, what with eyes? No. Well, they can sense light, right? Can't exactly. fungus sense light? Yes. So many fungus species are capable of sensing light. This is very helpful to them because they are. Um, then able to sense where photosynthetic organisms that they end up feeding on, you know, the detritus that's left over from those photosynthetic organisms. So the fungus being able to sense light, it's very ecologically important for it to be able to do that. But the question is, how long ago did these abilities start? Well, some researchers just publishing in Current Biology published their study a light sensing system in the common ancestor of the fungi. They were specifically looking at a particular system that they've discovered in one zoosporic fungus that's called Blastocladiella emersonii. Now, this Blastocladiella, it has an eye spot like organelle. So it's got lipids and it's got so fatty, like kind of fatty tissue. And this is a very different light sensing organ. But it's like this, this fungus basically has an, an eye spot. It's not just light sensing all over. It has an eye spot. And this eye spot is called the cyclop. See what they did there? Scientists. Oh, yeah, scientists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh. Anyway, the, the cyclop protein in this particular fungus, they're like, oh, did this just arise on its own? Or is this something that, you know, where'd it come from? Anyway, so they did a big comparison with a whole bunch of different fungal species. And they determined that it's not just because this one species is the only species we've found with an eye spot, the common ancestor of all funguses had all the genes necessary for eye spots. So all funguses could potentially have eyes, but they don't. Hmm. Why don't all funguses have eyes? This should now be the question. Well, it's because a long time ago, <laughs> the great, great, great grandpapa fungus uh, looked around, but it was before there was anything else to look at. So he said, what do I need these things for? Nothing to look at. I'm in the None dirt. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much it. A lot of funguses, the only time you see them is when they pop out into the light. Many of them are in the dark. So having an eye spot for many funguses isn't necessarily appropriate. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, eyes, it could have happened on funguses. Could have. And then my final, final study, because I got to give us some really fun, good news to go out on this 90 minute episode. <laughs> um, so you know how the Earth's magnetic poles are supposed to be flipping? Yeah. And we've heard lots and lots of stories over sure, the last, sure. what, 20 years that we've been doing the show that scientists are like, the Earth's poles, they're reversing. We're going to have a, mm -hmm. a pole switch, pole flop flip flop sure sure yeah yeah well um new study out of the proceedings of the national academy of sciences looking at a bunch of data going back about nine thousand years uh they go nah nope i think that all of the magnetic anomalies that we're seeing in the south atlantic right now that have been making everybody go whoo, whoo, magnetic flip flop it's coming they, they said, no, that the, these anomalies, quote unquote, are normal. We're just noticing We're like them. anomalies. <laughs> yeah, it's <Anomalies>. also <laughs> there. 
<laughs> well, the, also the magnetic flipping thing does happen, but it isn't it like it happens every, every two hundred thousand years. years? Like two hundred thousand, yeah. yeah. Every two hundred thousand years, okay. So I mean, but it's yeah. not completely regular. It does happen, and it could happen. But what these researchers but are saying wobbly. is that the evidence that people are using to say that a flip is coming is not necessarily evidence that a flip is coming. Okay. That it's kind of normal for that area of the South Atlantic. Looking at the data that they've seen, yes, Blair, anomalies. Mm -hmm. Yes. You're welcome. Yes. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll never sell those reverse compasses now. <laughs> no, but uh, they predict that if we're around for the next 300 years, we will see that the South Atlantic anomaly will probably disappear. This is their conclusion. So we only have this hypothesis, this new conclusion that's now a hypothesis that we have to wait to observe. We got to we have to wait 300 years. So patience on this one for Twist to be reporting on it. <laughs> 300 years oh, yeah what would that be that'd be like episode uh 15,000 <laughs> <laughs> episode how did we go this long uh -huh. oh we must have discovered the secret of longevity mm -hmm. Blair you'll you will live forever if that's the case did we make it to the end we did did we do it did we get here I think we're there should I play more um, ocean music for yeah, Justin? No, no. no. <laughs> don't yes. need it. I don't yes. need it. it was such a Give me one more. I don't need it. Hand, look on your face. Give me one more. <laughs> you want? We, we just we just want one more. That's all, right? Just one more. Yes, yes. One more. How about? Oh wait, did we see? We already did this one, didn't we? Let's go back to the Bering Sea. Oh sure. Utter nonsense. I Complete like and to... total nonsense. <laughs> Shout out to Fada. Thank you so much for your help with social media and show notes and all of the good stuff. Uh, and yes, the descriptions on YouTube. Gord and Identity4 and R and Laura and others, thanks for keeping the chat rooms a happy, wonderful place to be. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Rachel, thank you for your editing and other amazing assistance. And yes, thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you, Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, Ralphie Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vigard, Chef Dad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, aka Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gorov, Sharma, Ragan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson. Did I just read the same names over and over again? Anyway, I'm going. Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Runovich, Kevin Bruden, Noodles, Jack, Brian, Carrington, Matt Bass, Vote Beto for Texas, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessen, Flo Jean Telly, Steve Leesman, aka Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rampin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artie Om, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rondi Lewis, Paul, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Stu Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, EO, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Stephen Bell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. Now it's just going to be Blair. Wow. On next I'm going to start show. making Wait. random eyeball movements <laughs> based on based on a No. Okay. An hey, image wait. of a distant okay. pulsar caught in a radio telescope. If you love eyeball improvisational dance and us reporting on science, you can support us. Find information about that at our at twist.org. Click on Patreon link. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels, as well as twist.org slash live. 
Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast while you interpret the mathematical patterns of the ocean or the rainforests or the clouds? Just search for This Week in Science where podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, uh, stories and links to them are available on our website, www.twist.org, where you can also sign up for a by decadal <laughs> newsletter. Hey, man, you just got to follow the flow of when the newsletter comes oh, to man. you, you know? Hey, boy, it's not you gonna can blow contact up your inbox. us directly instead. <laughs> you can email Kiki at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, <laughs> Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line or your email. It'll get caught into that cosmic flow of sound and experience and movement <laughs> definitely not an ugly fish all complaints about the show should be sent to us via twitter <laughs> where we are at to a science at dr kiki at jackson fly and at blair's menagerie we love your feedback if there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview a haiku that comes to you in the night please let us know We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything on the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the And we have come to the end of another episode of This Week in Science. This Week in Science. I gotta bow. I gotta go. Uh, you gotta go. It was fun. Great show. I'll see Rest you up. all next week. Will you be back in Denmark next week? Uh... No. No? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. No, what? but maybe. No, but maybe. No, but maybe. Okay. I'm not scheduled to be back, but uh, I might go back sooner. It's getting hot and I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> At all. It's, it's Davis not, in the summer. It's You're... not nice. It's no. Not, it's not okay. It's and you, and really you think to not yourself, okay. How many years did I subject myself to this? But every time I left, I left to some place that like rained most of the year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or was near a beach. Except for the period of time when you lived in LA. No, no. I was I was on Venice Beach. I was right. I got at least the coastal breeze through the whole yeah. time. Yeah. The uh <laughs> the uh or the I was up in Humboldt with the yeah. With the tropical rainforest that is the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. raining. I mean, that's a cool days. place to be. Yep, that's great. Uh, you know, the one place that uh, it's too hot for me is is where I am right now. But I gotta go. <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta go change my sh my socks. I gotta go put them in front of the direct because I was wearing socks during the show and they're now soaking wet. Ew! I can't it's even. from. It's from. No, it's from sweat. Yeah. Oh, you. oh that's what, okay, that's Gross. what you thought. Okay, okay. All right, well, just has to go air out his socks. I'm going to go to bed. <sighs> air out that dirty laundry. Uh, 
Bye, Justin. Okay. You're going to head out as Bell. Let's do it. Yes. Let's Everybody's sorry, doing everyone. it. Wow. This is the, everyone's got sweaty socks, I guess. Yeah. That's <laughs> not me. Barefoot, baby. Barefoot, baby. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Um, is there anything? We got you for two more weeks, right? Before you. Two more weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are major, major things afoot in Portland. Really? Really? Interesting. I will talk about them later when they are more confirmed. Okay. Major things. Fun. Afoot. Good. Yes. yes. But then, yeah, two more weeks Can't and then wait. I'm off for a long vacation. The longest vacation I will have taken since I had Kai. Wow. That's great. Good for you. You deserve it. It's time. Thank you. Yes. It's time to go do it. All right. Um, yeah. So we have a couple more weeks to talk about things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know what, everyone out there? Twist on public television? Oh, that would be awesome. OPB, let's talk. Come on. OPB. Um, but yes, I believe that Blair is tired there are things that everyone here who does the show needs to go do, like sleep, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. I need to go take care of some things also. What is happening with this world? 10 o'clock. And we're out. We're out. Well, at least, I mean, it's it's less than a tight two hours right now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if we hold it. Yeah. It'll be All easy right, to edit night. down. All right. Good night, mm -hmm. Kiki. Or say good night, Blair. Say good night, Kiki. <laughs> good night, I did Blair. it wrong. Good night, Kiki. Good night. good night, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. We do appreciate it so much that you spend your Wednesdays with us. Thank you for joining us with the science. Give us a like before you leave, wherever you are, and uh, make sure to share it with friends. And we will see you next week with more more fun and more science. Right? Let's bring it. Tonight was a fun show. It was good. It was very fun. Yeah, it was good. Good night, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay curious. We'll see you on the flip side. <laughs>